With that said, let's look at our portion of Scripture today. We're going to be looking at Job chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. And as we are about to open up and, and our time in the Word, we do, we do thank you guys who are watching online. You know, it, uh, I, I get reports every week of those of you who are watching online, and it's great to have you with us. And there's a great amount of people who are watching right now. So we love you and thank you for joining us uh, in, our, in our service. One day I hope to have you back with us live as we're able to uh, once again go back to our regular Wednesday nights. So with that said, chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. So Job has been complaining, as we know, as we've been going through this book. He's been complaining to his friends for their lack of understanding and and he has taken the advice that they've been giving him as an attack, and so he has responded with a rebuke. Now, obviously, there are times when a person has to respond to someone's criticism, and when criticism is done properly, a response can actually become a learning experience. We need to be wise enough to receive instruction and correction. Like it says in Proverbs 26, verse 5, answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. There are times that we need to take what is being said to us and show that the person who's speaking it, show them where they're, they're wrong. And, and there are times where rebuke has to take place. And, and so obviously when a, a rebuke and a correction is, is, is being done in a proper way, we can, we can actually grow from that. Well, Job has been a little bit upset with his friends. He's been making some strong statements to them. Remember in chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, how he had, he had said to them, uh, no doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. He has said in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Behold, my eye has seen all this, my ear has heard and understood it. But you know, I also know, I'm not inferior to you. He's already made a few statements, strong comments to them, because of the way they're treating him, the things that they're saying to him. And as we've seen, he's frustrated with their lack of compassion and the direction of their comments. But when he concluded in chapter 13, it seems to me that his conclusion was, was actually rather touching because in verse uh, uh, 24 of chapter 13, he had asked the question, why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? And that's a strong comment. That's a strong statement. That's something that's very open because he feels abandoned by God. He feels like an object of God's anger, and he thinks that God is directing his anger towards him unfairly. He doesn't understand why he's going through such pain. He had asked in chapter 7, verse 20, Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? What have I done wrong? Is what he has said. And he's still continuing this line of thought as we enter into chapter 14. Well, in chapter 14, he continues his address, but it assumes a different note, if you will. He begins to evidence a kind of calm as if he's already vented most of his frustration, and he begins to speak in this way. In verse 1, he says, Man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower, fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. When he says that, he's simply making the observation that man's lifespan, because of it being shortened by sin, is really relatively short, and much of it can be very troubled. This is something that he's been saying. This is really a theme that is repeated in the book of Job. Remember in chapter 7, verse 6 and 7, he had said, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. He had said in Job 9, 25, My, my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. So he's speaking concerning how short a man's lifespan is. The brevity of human life 
is a common thought in Scripture. You see many making note of the fact that we don't live that long. Psalm 39, verse 5, You have made my days a mere hand's breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Or Psalm 90, verse 10, The length of our days is 70 years, or 80, if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Now, when he says the length of our days is 70 years, that makes my heart stop for just a moment. In James chapter 4, verse 14, James said, Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You see that theme over and over and over again in Scripture, that our life is but a breath. It's but a moment. You need to use the life that God has given to you for the best. I remember seeing a T-shirt imprinted with the words, he who dies with the most toys still dies. There have been T-shirts out there. Some of you perhaps saw them in the past where it says, he who dies with the most toys wins. But no, he who dies with the most toys still dies. Life is short. And for many without hope, man's life is often very short. And this is what Job is speaking about and, and troubled. You see, hope comes from God. And hope is the only tie which keeps the heart from breaking. In the Old Testament book of Lamentations, in chapter 3, verse 24, the writer says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. The psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 114 said, You are my hiding place, my shield. I hope in your word. Hope in, in Scripture very often is simply what is called confident expectation. Paul, to the book of, in the book of Romans, to the Romans said, we are saved by hope. It's not that kind of mentality that you say, like, I hope this or I hope if. No, it's a confidence. It's an expectation that God is good with his word. And, and we are, our hope is in him because he doesn't lie. We hope in his promises, the promises that he's made to us. We hope in him because his word is always right. We, we hope in him because in him is light and no darkness whatsoever. We hope in him because he's the truth, and because he is the truth, we can trust him. And, and then when we think of the mighty power of God, we know that God is able to do all things. But many of us will speak concerning the fact that God can do all things, and that is something that we need to remember, that there really is nothing within the framework of his character and his will that would be called impossible for him to do. Now, there are some things, and I want to say something to cause some of you to get mad. No, actually, to cause some of you to think with me for a moment. For a moment. You know, the scripture, there is scripture in, in the book of Luke, for example, nothing shall be impossible with God. And we, don't, we understand what that's saying. We understand what it means. But I, I'd like to give you, just for a moment, uh, another kind of shade to think about in your as you're walking and developing your, your, your walk in the Lord. Because if I were to say, uh, is there anything impossible with God? Well, thinking of, of, of the various portions of Scripture that speak about with God all things being possible, I think the natural response would be, no, there's nothing impossible with God. And so let me throw something at you that's going to make you think I'm a heretic for a moment. Most of you have already thought that at least once in your life anyway. But I want you to think with me for a moment. And the question would be, is there anything impossible with God? Is there anything impossible with God? And I have to be honest with you, as I was presenting this, preparing this Bible study, I thought I think I'll just share this with them and see how they, how they respond to it. Is there anything impossible with God? And the answer is yes, there is. So think for a moment with me. What do you mean by that, Mr. Heretic? In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, Hebrews, take your notes if you want. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie. So that's an impossibility. It's an impossibility for God to lie. Job 34, verse 10, far be it for God to do wickedness. It is impossible for God to do wickedness. God does not lie. God does not do wickedness. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it is impossible for God to have darkness because God is light 
and there is no darkness in him at all. Psalm 121, verse 4, God doesn't sleep. It's impossible for him to sleep. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Isaiah 40, 28, God, it's impossible for him to become tired. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. And it's impossible for him to be pleased if we don't exercise faith. Without faith, it's impossible for him to be pleased because he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God's power never is going to be contrary to his character. And so you can hope in God because God is good. You can hope in God because God keeps his word. You can hope in God because God has loved you with an everlasting love. You can hope in God for a variety of reasons, because he is trust, trustworthy, because there is no darkness in him at all. And God's mighty power really does work within us. But he also doesn't lie. He doesn't do wickedness. He doesn't have darkness in a variety of other things. So you can see God and know that God is good, and that God keeps his word, and that God is with you. And so as he's speaking here and he's sharing with us, notice how he says, man, again, verse one, man who is born of woman is a few days full of trouble. Your life is, is short and it seems that you go through one thing after another. He, he comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Just to show the brevity of human life. But again, you know, I, I don't know. I just was curious about some things this last week week as I was preparing this study. Notice how it says in verse 2, he comes forth like a flower and fades away. Some flowers, I'm sure I must have somebody watching right now or here with us who knows something about, about flowers and all. Did you know that some flowers only bloom for a single day? Some of you do. I didn't know that. Day lilies bloom one day. Mexican shell flowers one day. Hibiscus, one day. A certain kind of cactus that I won't try and pronounce its name, one day. Ohio's, Ohio spider wart, who wants that anyway? One day. <laughs> the picture is beauty that is temporary. And so he say, he comes for a, like a flower, but he's really short blossomed. He blooms for a short time. His beauty is only temporary. He flees, verse 2, like a shadow, a shadow. Shadows seem to flee away. You see the shadow of a cloud. You, you can see the shadow of a passing car. But when the sun goes down, shadows normally from the sun, shadows disappear. And so it's once again speaking of brevity. He says in verse 3, do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? And so you're the supreme Lord. You are holy. You are all powerful. Why are you looking upon someone like me? I, I'm like that flower. I'm like that shadow. But you, on the other hand, you are the everlasting God. Why are you wasting your time putting me through so much pain, is what he's saying. Then he goes on in verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. No man can spiritually cleanse another man. He's unclean by nature. Man doesn't become a sinner when he sins. Man sins because it's his nature to. And man, the Bible teaches, is sinful from conception. Like it says in Psalm 51, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. When Paul was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he said, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. And so when he says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. He's speaking of human nature. He's speaking the way that we are born. So the knowledge of our own sins is actually used by God to draw us to himself. 
It is often what causes us to seek him. We seek him for forgiveness. We seek him for peace. We seek him to be released from the prison that we're living in. And often our awareness of our sin is used by the Lord to draw us to himself. It's like what the psalmist said in Psalm 51 too, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Or Psalm 51 verse 10, where he said, create in me a pure heart, O God, renew a, a steadfast spirit within me. The knowledge of your sin is something that the Lord uses to draw you to forgiveness. So very often I've seen people try and tell sinners that they're really not that bad when in fact sinners are bad. We all need a savior. We all do. Just this evening, I had the opportunity of sharing with somebody and he was talking to me about, about, uh, about religion and all. And, uh, and uh, I had a conversation with him for just a little while tonight and, and spoke a little bit about his religious background. And, 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 and I, I tried to gently share with him a little bit about the fact that, well, I told him this. I said, you know, I said, in order to go to heaven, you have to be perfect. And the awareness of our own imperfection is what drives us to the one who is perfect. That's Jesus Christ. And so I was sharing with him just a little bit because the door, the window of opportunity opened for just a moment. And I was able to share just a few things. And, and I told him, I said, listen, if you ever want to talk, because he said, you know, I have so many questions. I said, I'd be more than willing. I said, if you've got questions, I'd love to answer them. So I, I, I'll give you the time, you know, let's, you know, let's talk about these things. Because that's what drives people. He's aware right now that he really isn't right with God. And that's a good thing. This knowledge is a good thing because God often uses it to draw us to himself. And so the question in verse 4 again, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one, no human being can. It takes the blood of Christ to cleanse us from all of our sins. He says in verse 5, since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You've appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. Man's life, he's saying, is limited in its duration by God himself. And that's why the psalmist would say in Psalm 39, verse 4, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Make me aware of these things. When you're young, you think you're going to live forever. When you're young, you're daring. When you're young, your body heals. I mean, you can go outside and you, you can cut yourself accidentally with a bottle and just watch it as your, as your skin heals in front of you. When you're young, it's that way. When you get old, you say, oh, man, my back hurts. I guess forever. I mean, it, it doesn't change. So when you're young, you think that you're going to continue on, don't you? When you're young, but as you grow older, you also grow aware. You grow aware of the fact that it's, if your life was like a, uh, like one of those sand kind of timepieces where the, the sand uh, uh, just comes through grain at a time until it's empty, you, you become aware of the fact that you're on a timetable. And, and so that's why the psalmist is wise to say, uh, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Awaken me to the awareness that I may feel that I'm growing old here, but compared to eternity, I'm a vapor. vapor. It's just a moment. It comes and it goes quickly. I've often tried to imagine what eternity is like, and every once in a while, I just it hurts my head to think that way because eternity, eternity is, to me, it, it, I thought, well, eternity is like counting every grain of sand on every beach and every desert, one by one. And then once you've counted every grain, starting over again. You know, sometimes we don't realize that, that this life that we have, 70, perhaps 80 years or longer for me, by means of strength, maybe you'll live to be 90 or 100, but the fact is we ultimately all will die unless the rapture happens. We need to be prepared. We need to be aware and he says, since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You've appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. God, you're in control of everything. Our lives are limited. So it's important for us to use that knowledge with wisdom. Again, in Psalm 90, verse 2, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. 
when the Lord Jesus was speaking in a story in Luke chapter 12, verse 20, he had made the statement, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Because this individual said, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'll store all my goods. And the Lord says, no, it is appointed unto men to die once. And after this, the judgment. I am going to require your soul from you today. And then who's going to inherit all the things that you worked all your life to get? I've shared this with you before, but I haven't done so recently. So perhaps if you've heard me say this, you may remember. But most of you have not heard me say this how that I, have a, a, I had a cousin named Eleanor, and she was married to a man named Manuel many years ago now. And Manuel worked in a particular company until his time of retirement. And so he retired, we'll say on Friday, and then Friday night he had his retirement party. So his friends and, and all came to, his co-workers came to celebrate with Manuel, how that Manuel, my cousin, was uh, now a retired man. He was going to be able to go fishing and do all the vacations and the things that he wanted, my cousin. And yet, he had his party. He went to bed that night and died in his sleep. He died in his sleep. I've never forgotten that. He planned his retirement. He had it all set up. He had his friends over. They had a party. He's retired. Now the good life begins. He put his head on his pillow and never raised it. He died in his sleep. So I learned at an earlier age that, that tomorrow is promised to no one. You have to prepare every day as if it's your last day. You live as if it's your last day. You do for the Lord that which you should be doing at all times. And so we ask the Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom because we know that our life will be demanded of us. In verse 6, he continues, Look away from him that he may rest till like a hard man he finishes his day. Stop watching him continually. Look away from him. Stop watching him continually. Give him some breathing room. He needs a space to rest. Give him a reason to rejoice when his life ends for the right reason. So look away from him that he may rest till like a hard man he finishes his day. Verse 7, for there is hope of a tree if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease, though its root may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. An olive tree, very interesting trees, an olive tree can be cut down but it actually can be revived and grow. When you go to Israel, you'll find this interesting. Uh, they're on the Mount of Olives. It's called the Mount of Olives because it was actually a place where there are many olive trees, the Mount of Olives. And you can go to that particular mount, and then they'll give you some history related to that area, and they'll tell you how the Romans, when they were uh, conducting a siege against uh, Jerusalem, they cut down all the trees. So this place was a grove. This, it's a hillside. It's not just a small area. It's actually a, it's a, it's a, it's got a, a good amount of land up there where there were a lot of olive trees. And, and you'll go into a particular place where they have a, a church that has been built, and there is a, an olive tree there that is several hundred years old, several hundred years. And you'll walk in and you'll look at this olive tree, and, you know, there are people who say it's 900 years old. There are others, you know, for whatever reason, they may tell you it could all the way, date all the way back to the time of Christ. And some people like to say that, but it's a very old olive tree. It's right there. And that's where you learn that, that even though the olive tree can be cut, if its roots go down at the scent of water, it can actually be restored. And it produces buds and shoots, and it actually continues to grow. And so Job is speaking concerning that. He says, even if, if that tree appears to be dead, when, when it receives water, uh, it, it can once again sprout and it can be revived. It, it, it can grow. And so, so he's speaking of the hope for a tree, but, but he should have taken that hope for himself because he goes on to say in verse 10, but man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? 
as water disappears from the sea and a river becomes parched and dries up. So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. There's hope for a tree, he's saying, but in comparison, there's not really hope for man. Man dies and all hope dies with him. Now, what this reveals to us is really an undeveloped understanding of what we call an afterlife. You see, that understanding of what occurs after death in Scripture is actually progressively revealed over time. So he doesn't have a, a real understanding of that subject and what the Lord plans to do. So he's speaking concerning where he's at right now, and he's thinking, well, if man dies, he dies without hope. He, he doesn't rise. Look again, verse, verse 12, man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They'll not awake nor be roused from their sleep. He's saying there's more hope for a tree than there is for a man. So I'm saying trees have more hope, but I wish you would put me in the grave. Oh, I wish that you would hide me. I wish you would put me in a hiding place until your wrath is satisfied. That's what he's saying in verse 13. I, I wish you would put me there. But remember, <laughs> just remember where I am and reclaim me. Oh, that you would hide me in a grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. If a man dies, shall he live again? Let's look at that for just a moment. That's one of those questions that are called an ancient question. It's a question that has been posed by man almost from the beginning. If a man dies, shall he live again? And the answer to that question is yes. The unrighteous, as they die, they go to a waiting place now. The waiting place that they go to in the New Testament is referred to as Hades. It is where the unrighteous dead are. But the righteous dead, those who die in Christ in, this, in, this, in our time, in our day, the righteous who die are actually absent from the body and present with the Lord. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 20, verses 13 through 15, it says the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul said it like this. He said, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. When you die, the scriptures speak to us as having the appearance of sleep. When Jesus was going to, to raise Lazarus from the dead, he had said, he sleeps. And the reason he said he sleeps is because when you're reposed in death, it looks like you're asleep. But he said, and I'm going to awaken him. And so we here on, on the earth, we may close our eyes, but we're instantly transported into the presence of the Lord because Jesus had said, um, if you believe in me, you will never die. He said, do you believe this? So the body has the appearance of sleep, but we are instantly in the presence of God. Absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. So the question has been asked of me, what happens when, when a believer dies? Well, they're buried, but their, their spirit soul life is with the Lord instantaneously. You remember how Jesus in John 14, verse 3 said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So I have hope in the Lord that even though one day it'll be said, perhaps, should the rapture not occur before this event, it may be said, and there are others who have said this before me, long before me, my own pastor said this, and, and others before him said the same thing. Dwight Al Moody is very well known for saying this kind of thing. 
But they, Moody said something, I'm paraphrasing. Moody said, you're going to hear that Dwight Al Moody has died. He says, don't believe it, because at that moment, I will be more alive than I ever was on the face of the earth. And that's true. Pastor Chuck said that. He said, you know, he said, I'm just going to be changing residences. That's all. I'll be moving from one place to another. See, for the believer, and perhaps I need to share this for a moment, perhaps there are those online that this may be something to think about. For the believer, we have been delivered from the fear of death. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be delivered from the fear of death. I see a lot of Christians who aren't relieved of that fear. Death is not my friend. Death is an enemy. Jesus Christ conquered death. And because Jesus Christ conquered death in Christ, I am alive. And so the day will come when somebody says, Pastor David, did you hear he, he, he died? And you can say, no, he's with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that some people won't mourn your going. Let's hope that somebody cares that you're dead. But we don't cry as those with no hope. We don't, we don't mourn as those with no hope. It's not goodbye. It's not saying goodbye. It really isn't. That doesn't mean that your heart doesn't hurt. That doesn't mean that you don't have tears. It doesn't mean, I, I believe that Christians, because we love deeper, we hurt deeper. I believe that. I really do. The deeper you love, the deeper you miss, the stronger your love, the greater the pain. That's a fact. I mean, think about it. Somebody who hardly knew dies, and you say, I'm sorry, I am. Somebody you didn't know dies, and you say, oh, that's too bad. But somebody you really love dies, and your heart breaks. It's the degrees of relationship that you have and your understanding of fellowship. And all of those things are part of your grief process. And the deeper you love, the deeper you will hurt. But we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. We don't sorrow that way. We sorrow with a different kind of sorrow, a missing. But we also have this bittersweet awareness that it's, just a, it's not goodbye. It's, I'll see you later. I will see you again. And one of these days, you know, you'll be rejoined to that person. And there'll be joy. And, and all your sorrow will be swallowed up in a moment. But believers, there are so many right now that, I, that I'm hearing from that are afraid. Of what? Of what? You know, I'll be honest with you. Everybody knows this. I'm not telling a secret. I'm in that age group that's supposed to be afraid. 65 and up, I'm a dead man. I refuse to live in fear. I'm just not going to do that. Just, I'm just not going to do that. You know, the, there, I've been preparing my life to be with Jesus since I was 20. And what? Now I'm going to say, let me stay longer? No, I, I don't want to live a second longer than he wants me here. There are obvious things that relate to that. All of you understand. I have a wife. I have children. I have grandchildren. It's not like I want to go. I'm not running around saying, do you have COVID? May I kiss you? I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, I think there needs to be a wisdom. But I refuse to drive my car wearing a mask. <laughs> I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to be held in bondage. I see so many people walking down the street by themselves with their masks on, and sometimes their masks not even put on properly. You almost want to walk up and lift it for them and say, come on, get with it. What's wrong with you? You know what I mean, don't you? Don't you trip a bit? And that's an old word. That's called an anachronism. 
Isn't it interesting to see people driving by with their windows all rolled up and their masks, three or four masks on their head, you know, or walking around with these sparkless bottles that they've cut and put over their head? <laughs> That's their Halloween mask. And when I, when I see that, it just amazes me. Do not tempt the Lord your God. But don't live in fear either. Don't live in fear. It's just a, it's a waste of your time. It really is. It's a waste of your time. Every day, oh, don't get too close. Oh, don't stand next to me. Oh, no. You know, it trips me. Here we go. I'm using anachronisms. I'm, I'm an old hippie, and I keep using the same thing. It trips me out. Um, so you pull up, and you go to a, a drive through and, and they hand you your food in the drive through at McDonald's or whatever, and they've got their mask, or maybe they put it out in some way. But didn't somebody make that food? Didn't somebody with their hands touch it? But you think you're making me feel comfortable? The only way I'd feel comfortable if I made my own food. You know what I'm saying? And there's so many things like this that are absurd. They're absurd. It makes no sense to a thinking person. But for some reason, America has just lockstepped. We've just gotten in line with this. And why are people doing this? For fear of death, for the fear of death. That's why. And, and the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ set us free by, by breaking the, 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 the strength of the enemy who kept people all their lifetime in, in fear of death. Hebrews 2.14, in fear of death. That's the tool the enemy uses. Fear has torment, 1 John 4 tells us. It has torment. It causes you agony. He who fears has not been made perfect or mature in love, for fear has torment, John said. It's a fear of the future. What's going to happen? If I really believe that God has my life in his hands and my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, I'm not going to test him. I'm not going to stand on the pinnacle of a temple and jump off to see if the angels carry me. They ain't going to do it. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to go run in front of a Greyhound bus to see because uh, I'll be the insignia on the front of that bus. <laughs> ain't going to happen. So you don't test the Lord, but you don't live in fear either. You don't live in fear either. Our lives are not long. They're not so long that I can give up several days to be afraid in it. I just can't. So I believe that all of us, and maybe some disagree, and that's all right if you do. Some people have good reason to take care of their health because they're vulnerable to and susceptible to, and they have, um, you know, extenuating circumstances and, and, and health conditions that, that they ought to be very wise. I'm not, I'm not knocking that at, at all. I agree and understand that. What I'm saying is that under normal circumstances, we believers, using our common sense, our God-given common sense, and an awareness of everything around us, don't have to be in bondage to fear because we're living wisely. And because we're exercising wisdom and not tempting the Lord, I don't live in fear. But I don't tempt the Lord either. I'm not running into hospitals and, and touching all the COVID patients. I'm not doing that either. What I'm doing is trying to live wisely under the circumstances we find ourselves in. And I simply don't want to be in bondage to fear the way I see so many others who really are, who really are. The bottom line is, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Jesus went to prepare a place for us, and that's where we're going. And I look forward to that, so I'm not going to live in fear. I live in hope. I ought to move on. Verse 16. For now you number my steps, but do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag and you cover my iniquity. And so verse 16, now you cover, number my steps. He has hope for the future, but he finds it hard to get past to what is happening right now. 
Notice how he said, you have numbered my steps, looking closely at how I have lived, and you have found my faults. So I would ask that you might overlook what I have done. I would ask that you be merciful to me. I would ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I would also say, please do not punish me for them. When he says in verse 17, my transgression is sealed up in a bag, you cover my iniquity, uh, at that time, people would put money in a bag and they would seal it, that would lock, they would lock it, and they would store it. So when he says my transgression is sealed up in a bag, the sense here is you've counted up my sins, you have an exact number, an exact count of them. You're aware of that. You have stored my sins in a bag and you've sealed it so none are lost, meaning you're aware of everything that I've done. And that's what causes him sorrow. But he goes on in verse 18 and he says, but as a mountain falls and crumbles away and as rock is moved from its place, as, as water wears away stones, as torrents wash away the soil of the earth, so you destroy the hope of man. You prevail forever against him. And he passes on. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor. He doesn't know it. They are brought low. He does not perceive it. But his flesh will be in pain over it, and his soul will mourn over it. And so this portion here, starting at verse 18 to the conclusion at verse 22, is, is really a, a section that is closing with sorrow. In verse 18, he speaks of a mountain falling, crumbling away, a rock moved from its place. He's saying even a mountain can be worn down over time. Mountains erode. Rocks are exposed. Once they're exposed, they roll down the face of the mountain. Water erodes the stones that are exposed. And then a flood removes the stone. So he's just speaking of how things deteriorate. In verse 19, even so, through constant pressure, a man's hope is often squeezed out of him, is what he's saying. I'm, I'm completely undone. I have no hope at all. When he says you prevail forever against him, he's saying you remove his smile and you replace it with an expression of sorrow from the pain he has. You overpower him. He dies. His face, his body are altered over time. You send him away by death and you put him in a waiting place called Sheol. And as he's there, his countenance and all is, is changing because of death. His sons come to honor. He doesn't know it. They're brought low. He doesn't perceive it. But his flesh will be in pain over it, and his soul will mourn over it. His sons come to honor. Even if his children are honored or humbled, he doesn't know that. And as he's dying, his pain has kept him from noticing life around him. And ultimately, as he dies... He dies without hope, and he dies in sorrow. His flesh will be in pain over it, and his soul will mourn over it. And he's speaking about the way men die. They can die in pain, and they can die in sorrow. They didn't live long enough to see the honors that were given to their children. They simply go to a grave and deteriorate the way a mountain does, the way water can wash away a stone. Now, I hate to, I, I don't want, I'm going to, I'm going to close here, but I'm not going to close bummed out over this. Let's, I'm trying to think of the right thing to say. It's taken a moment. When I gave my heart to Christ and when I began to learn of the hope of heaven, coming from the background I came from, I didn't believe that anybody knew if they could go to heaven or not. I didn't believe that you could know. There was no way possible I was taught to really know. I was taught there were certain things that I had to do in order to try to 
assure myself of at least a hope or possibility of going to heaven. So that was my religious background. Some of you have religious backgrounds that are similar to what mine was. And that's what I was taught. I was taught things related to death, and I was taught things related to heaven and access to heaven. And I did have religious instruction as I grew up, and I did remember it. I didn't forget it. But I never had what you would call an assurance, a confidence, an awareness that, that, that my sins are really forgiven. I did not have that. I did not have a hope of heaven. I, I had a hope of, of, of purgatory because I was raised in the Catholic Church. I, I had a hope perhaps of purgatory, but my only hope would be that, that somebody would love me enough to pray my soul out of it. And that's kind of how I grew up. And that was my, my understanding. That's how I, how I was taught when I was taking catechism classes at the age of seven or eight at St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs. I had one of these uh, little booklets, and in the booklet that I had in front of me during the catechism class, the teacher was sharing, us, sharing with us concerning things, you know, pertaining to our religious faith and all of that. And I found a section that spoke of prayers that you could pray. Some of you may have seen this before. It's, it was in this particular book, prayers that you could pray that would get you a certain amount of days out of purgatory. If you prayed this prayer, you'd get 100 days removed. If you prayed this prayer, you would get 50 days removed. I don't know if they still make those, but they did back in the 50s, and I had one there at the desk as I was sitting there in catechism. Catechism was over an hour, and I sat there for the whole hour praying these prayers, not even listening to what was being said, praying these prayers, counting up how many days I was knocking off my time. Seriously, because that's what I was being taught. That's what they were teaching me. If you pray this prayer, you will knock off 100 days. If you pray this, it's 50. So I looked for the prayer that would knock off the most days. And I knocked off a lot of days. You can knock off a lot of days in an hour. And that pretty much, that's the truth. That was pretty much how I saw God and I saw his economy and I saw his mercy and his grace and his love. And, and that's what I thought Christian faith was. It was working really hard and doing all these things that are very important to do and that perhaps God would have these scales and my good things would outweigh the bad things. And that's how I basically grew up. I'm not blaming everything on, on the religious teaching I had. There's a lot of things I added to it, I'm sure. But that's how I thought. And so by the time I was 13, after my confirmation, I got tired of trying to be good. Bottom line. You see, my, my mother was very ill when I was a child. My mom was ill from the time I was four. And my mom was in and out of the hospital often when I was a child. So I would go to bed with a mother who was in the hospital and concerned that she was going to die. My mom had epilepsy, and, and I would come home sometimes, and my mom would be on the ground, and I, at the age of seven, eight, nine, I would, I would get alcohol, and I would rub it on her forehead, and I would, I would nurse her back. I did that. I'd take care of my, my sisters, my two little sisters. I'd come in, and I'd scoot them into another room, and I'd stay there with my mom because my mom had such severe epilepsy that I never knew when I came home whether she'd be on the floor or on the couch. And it happened for a long time, weeks into months. And I remember I was, I was at home as, as a, a young boy, and, and I was crying. My mom was once again in, in the hospital. I missed her. And my dad walks in, and he says, why are you crying, son? I said, because mom was in the hospital. He said, if you're a good boy, she won't go. So I tried. I really did. I tried to be the best kid I could be so my mom would get well. And I did that and did that till I was 13, 14 years old. I'm going to be the best kid I can be. I, I, I got good grades in school. I, I was a good boy. People would call David a good, that's a good boy. My mom didn't get well. By the time I got to be 15, I said, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. All my friends are going out, learning to do things, doing things, messing around. Me, I'm, I'm, and it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay off. And I became one of those kids who turned from the good kid to the sneaky kid. And I started doing the alcohol, and I started doing the drugs, and I started stealing. I did all those things. 
because I thought, I, I, you believe in a God and God's supposed to heal. He didn't heal your mother and he's not going to put you in heaven. You might as well just enjoy life. Your friends are, and I did. And I did that and did that and did that until I was 20 years old. And at the age of 20, I had already lived a crazy life that a lot of people hadn't lived, not in that period of time, the way I did. And that's what made me ripe to the grace of God, open to hearing about his goodness. And that's why when the Jesus movement came and, and, and my friend Bill and, and others were telling me about how good God is and how loving God is, that's why I wanted to believe that. I wanted to believe in a good God. There's something in me that, that wanted to believe that there is a God who's kind. There is a God who loves. There is a God who cares. There is a place that you can go called heaven. And you don't have to be perfect in your own right. It, it's a perfection of Christ. That's called the gospel. And I'd never heard it. I'd never heard the gospel and all of my religious instruction. I'd never heard God so loved the world that he gave his son. I had never heard that. And it was revolutionary to me. And what happened is this radical kid who was, who was into sin and wanted to be the greatest sinner discovered the greatness of the grace of God. So my life is lived with hope now. The hope that is confident. That knowledge that, that God forgives sins. That God cleanses from all unrighteousness. That God loves and that God gave his son. And that God will give me a, a command, but he also gives me the power to be able to obey it. He doesn't command me to climb a mountain. He, he actually Carries me up. I learned it through the grace of God. So one of these days, should the Lord tarry and I go and I die? <laughs> I'm not dying hopeless. I will be in the grave just awaiting my friends and family to come. And I'll be in the presence of the Lord. So I, I, I am going, I live in hope and I will die in hope because the Lord Jesus Christ is my hope because the Lord Jesus Christ was raised the third day. He will raise us with him. We live because he lives, not because we're good, but because he is. And so we'll stop there because that's good news, right? And we'll pick up on some more bad news next time we're together. <laughs>